each step forward until you go to the bottom and hit the forward play button. Uh, well, then it goes automatic. And then you let it go one slide, and then you hit pause, and then you can use the arrow key. Okay. Well, I do apologize for the uh, under, uh, for the uh, EuroBSD con slides. I'd redone the title page and redone the uh, and made some changes to the slides, and then they didn't make it through approval uh, by uh, this afternoon. So. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, doing. Uh, 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 about isolating jobs for uh, performance and predictability on clusters. But before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about who we are and what our problem space is like, because that uh, dictates our, that, that uh, has an effect on our solution space. So um, I work for uh, the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, we, we work, for, we, we operate a federally funded research and development center uh, in the area of national security space. And in particular, we work with uh, Air Force Base and Missile Command and with uh, the National Reconnaissance Office. And our engineers support um, a wide variety of uh, activities within that area. So we have uh, a bit over 1,400, or uh, sorry, 2,400 engineers. Um, in virtually every discipline, we have, uh, as you would expect, we have uh, rocket scientists, uh, we have people who build satellites. We have people who build sensors that go on satellites, people who study the sort of things that you see when you use those sensors, that sort of thing. Um, we also have civil engineers and electronic engineers and process computer process people. Um, so we literally do everything related to space and all sorts of things that you might not expect to be related to space. Uh, since we also, for instance, help build ground systems because the satellites aren't very useful if there isn't anything to talk to them. Um, and these engineers, since they're solving all these different problems, we have uh, uh, engineering applications in you know virtually every size you could think of, ranging from you know little spreadsheet things that you might not think of as an engineering application, but they are, um, to MATLAB programs or a lot of C code, a lot of traditional parallel or uh, serial code, and then large parallel applications, um, either in-house uh, genetic algorithms and that sort of thing or traditional you know, classic parallel code like you would have run on a Cray or something, material simulation uh, or, uh, um, or, that, or uh, fluid flow or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so we, we have this big application space. Just wanted to give a little introduction to that because we, it does come back and influence what we, uh, the sort of solutions we look at. So, so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, research, oops, we skipped a slide. There we are. That's a little better. Um, so now, what I'm interested in is I, I do high performance computing at, at the company, and I provide high performance computing resources to our users um, as part of my, my role in our, our technical computing services uh, organization. Um, so our primary resource at this point is uh, the fellowship cluster. Um, it's uh, for the name for the fellowship of the ring. Um, so it's uh, 11 racks of nodes, rack of core systems. Uh, over here, there's a Cisco, a large Cisco switch. Actually, today there are now two 6509s in VSS mode because we couldn't get the port density we wanted otherwise. Um, and primarily a gigabit Ethernet system. Runs FreeBSD, currently six because we haven't upgraded it yet. Um, planning to move probably to 7.1 or maybe slightly past 7.1. Um, if we want to get the, uh, the latest uh, HW PMC changes in. Uh, we use the SunGrid engine scheduler. It's one of the two main options for open source uh, resource managers on clusters, the other one being uh, the uh, Torque uh, and Maui combination from cluster resources. Uh, so we also have, it's actually 40 terabytes. That's really the raw number on a uh, Sun Thumper and uh, about 32 usable once you start using RAID Z2, since you might actually like to have your data should a disk fail. Um, and uh, with today's disks, RAID, RAID 5 doesn't really cut it. Um, and then we also have some other resources coming on, but I'm going to be constant two smaller clusters, unfortunately, probably running Linux um, and some SMPs. But I'm going to be concentrating here on the work we're doing on our, uh, on our FreeBSD based cluster. So, first of, all, first of all, I'm going to talk about why we want to share resources. Um, should be fairly obvious, but I'll talk about it a little bit. And then what goes wrong when you, share, when you start sharing resources. 
Uh, after that, I'll, I'll talk about some different solutions to those problems and some, some fairly trivial experiments that we've done so far in terms of enhancing the schedule or using operating system features uh, to uh, mitigate those problems um, and, uh, and then conclude with some uh, future work. So obviously, if you have a resource the size, the size of our cluster, you know, 1,400 cores roughly, uh, you probably want to share it unless you purpose built it for a single application. Uh, you're you're going to want to have your users sharing it. Um, and you don't want to just say, you know, you get it on Monday. It's probably not going to be a very effective option, especially not when we have as many users as we do. Um, you know, we also can't just afford to buy another one every time a user shows up. Uh, so one of our senior VPs said uh, a while back, um, you know, we can probably afford to buy just about anything we could need once. Uh, we can't just buy 10 of them, though. You know, uh, you know, if we really, really needed it, you know, dropping small numbers of millions of dollars on, on competing resources wouldn't be impossible. But uh, we can't go, you know, just have every engineer who wants one just call up Dell and say, ship me 10 racks. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, and the other thing is that we can't, we need to also provide quick turnaround for some users. So we can't have one user hogging the system and hogging it until they're done. Because we have some users, that, you know, and then the next one show, can, can run. Because we have, we have some users who will come in and say, well, I need to run for three months. And uh, we've, ha we've, we've had, that, had users come in and re literally run pretty much using the entire system for three months. But, so we've had to provide some, some ability for other users to still get their work done. So we can't just, uh, so we do have to, have to have some sharing. However, when you start to share any resource uh, like this, there, you, you start getting contention. Um, users need the same thing at the same time, and so they, they fight back and forth for it, they can't get what they want, so you have to balance them a bit. Um, you know, also, um, some jobs uh, lie when they uh, request uh, resources and they actually need more than they ask for, um, which can cause problems. Um, so we, we schedule them, we say, oh, you're going to fit here, here, fine, and then they go run off and use more than they said. Um, and if we don't have a mechanism to constrain them, we have problems. Um, you know, likewise, once these users start to contend, uh, that doesn't just result in the jobs taking, taking longer um, in terms of wall clock time, because they're cleanly swapping, but there's overhead related to that contention. They get swapped out due to pressure on, the, on the various systems. Um, if you really for instance, run out of memory, then you go into swap and you end up wasting all your cycles, pulling, pulling junk in and out of disk, waste your bandwidth on that. So there, 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 are, um, resource, there, there are resource costs to the contention, not merely um, a delay in returning results. So now I'm going to switch gears and start talking, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different solutions to these, to, to these, uh, uh, these contention issues. And, uh, um, and and look at, at different ways of solving a problem. Most of these are things that have already been done, um, but I just want to talk about the different ways and then evaluate them in our context. Um, so a classic solution to the problem is gang scheduling. Um, it's basically conventional Unix process uh, context switching writ really big. Um, you uh, what what you do is you have your your parallel job that's running on a on a system and it runs for a while, and then after a certain amount of time, you basically shove it all, you kick it off of all the nodes and uh, let the next one come in. You know, typically when, when people do this, they do it on the order of hours because the context switch time is extremely large, is extremely uh, high. Um, in, you know, for, for example, because it's not just like swapping a process in and out, you suddenly have to coordinate the, this context switch across all of your processes. Um, if you're running, say, uh, MPI over TCP, you actually need to tear down the TCP sessions because you can't just have TCP timers sitting around um, and that sort of thing. So there, there's, there's a lot of overhead associated with this. So you take a long context switch. Um, if all of your infrastructure supports this, um, it's fairly effective. Um, and it does allow jobs to avoid interfering with each other, which is nice. Um, so you, can't, you don't have issues because you're typically allocating whole swaths of the system. Um, and for our appropriately written applications, um, partial results can be returned, which for some of our users is really important. Where you're doing an iterative refinement, um, users will want to look at the results and say, okay, you know, is this 
just going off into the weeds, or does it look like it's actually converging on some sort of useful solution? Um, and so they don't want to just wait till the end. Um, downside, of course, is that these contact switches are costs are very high, and most importantly, there's really a lack of useful implementations. Um, a number of platforms have implemented this in the past, but in practice on modern clusters, which are built on commodity hardware with uh, uh, you know, communication libraries written on standard protocols, the tools just aren't there. Um, and, and so it's not very practical. Also, it doesn't really make a lot of sense with small jobs. And one of the things that we've found is we have users who have um, embarrassingly parallel problems where they need to look at do you know, 20,000 studies. And they could write something that looked more like a conventional parallel application where they you know, wrote a scheduler and set up a MPI, message passing interface, and uh, handed out tasks to pieces of their job, and then you could do this. But then they'd be writing a scheduler. They'd probably do a bad job of it. You know, it turns out it's actually fairly difficult to do right, even in a trivial case. Um, and so what they do instead is they just submit 20,000 20, jobs to Grid Engine, and it says, okay, whatever, I'll deal with it. Um, you know, earlier versions, that might have been a problem. Current versions of the code handle easily a million jobs, so not really a big deal. Um, but those sort of users wouldn't fit well into the gang-scheduled environment, um, at least not in a, in a, in a conventional gang-scheduled environment where you do the gang-scheduling on the granularity of jobs. So from that perspective, it wouldn't work very well. Uh, if you have all the pieces in place it's a, and you're doing big parallel applications, it is, in fact, an extremely effective approach. Um, so another option, which is sort of related, um, it's, in fact, uh, take, taking an even coarser granularity, is single application or single project uh, clusters or subclusters. Uh, for instance, uh, this is used at some national labs where you're given a cycle allocation for a year based on your grant proposals, and what your cycle allocation actually comes to you as is, here's your cluster. You know, here's a front end. Here's this chunk of nodes. They're yours. Go to it. Install your own OS, whatever you want. It's yours. Um, you know, at, and then at, at, a, at a sort of finer scale, there are things such as uh, uh, you could use Emulab, uh, which is a network emulation system, but also does OS install and configuration. Uh, so you could do dynamic allocation that way. Uh, Sun's... Uh, Project Hedeby, now actually I think it's called Service Domain Manager, um, is the productized version. Or uh, some, there was some work at Duke on clusters on demand. Um, they were actually talking about web, web hosting clusters, but uh, uh, things that allow rapid deployment, unless you do that at a little, little uh, uh, a more granular level than, than, the, uh, than the allocate them once a year approach. But nonetheless, um, let, let you give people whole clusters to work with. Um, the nice one nice thing about it is the uh, the isolation between the processes is is, is complete um, so you don't have to worry about users stomping on each other it's their own system they can trash it all they want um, you know if they flood the network or they run or they uh, run the nodes into swap well that's their problem um, and it also has the advantage that you can tailor the uh, the images on the nodes or the operating systems to meet the exact needs of the application downside, of course, is it's coarse granularity. In our environment, that doesn't work very well um, since we do have all of these, all of these different types of jobs. Um, context switches are also pretty expensive, um, certainly on the order of minutes. Uh, Emulab typically claims something like 10 minutes. Um, there are some systems out there. Um, for instance, if you use, I think it's OpenBoot they're calling it today, it used to be Linux BIOS, um, where, you, where you can actually deploy a system in tens of seconds, um, mostly by getting rid of all the junk the BIOS writers wrote, um, and the OS boots pretty fast if you don't have all of that stuff delaying you. Um, but in practice, on, on sort of off-the-shelf hardware, context switch times are quite high. Um, users, of course, can interfere with themselves. You know, you can argue it's not a problem, but ideally you would like to, pre to uh, prevent that. One of the things that I have to deal with is that my users are you know, almost universally not trained as computer scientists or programmers. You know, they're, they're trained in their domain area, they're really good in that area, but their concepts of the way hardware works and the way software works don't match reality in many cases. In practice, how often does this uh, project subcluster sub structure that you're talking about come up? It seems like a nightmare for me. Um, it's pretty rare in practice. 
Um, I, I, I've heard of one, one lab that does it significantly, but it's like they do it on a sort of a yearly allocation basis, and they throw the hardware away after two or three years. And you do you do typically have some sort of a deployment system in place, but or or in, in those types of cases, actually, usually your application comes with, and here's what we're going to spend on you know this many people as sysadmins for this project. So this is big resource allocation. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I guess one one other issue with this is there's no no real easy way to capture un underutilized resources. For example, if you have an application which uh, you know is say single threaded and uses a ton of memory um, and is running on a machine, well, the machines we're buying these days are eight core, so um, you know that's wasting a lot of CPU cycles. You're just generating a lot of heat doing nothing. Um, so ideally, you would like a scheduler that said, okay, so you're using eight of you know you're using seven of the eight gigabytes of RAM, but we've got these jobs sitting here that you know, need next to no, you know, need need 100 megabytes. So we could slap seven of those in along with the big job and uh, backfill. And in this application, this mechanism, there's no no good way to do that. Um, you know, obviously, if the users have that application mix, they can do it themselves, but it doesn't, it's not something where we can easily bring in, uh, bring in more jobs and have, have, diff have a, a mix to take advantage of the different resources. A related approach is to to virtual to install virtualization software on the equipment. I mean, this this is a you know this is the essence of what cloud computing is at the moment. Um, you know it's you know Am Amazon providing Zen uh, Zen hosting for our, for relatively arbitrary uh, OS images. Um, you know it, it does have the advantage that it allows rapid deployment. In theory, if your application is scalable, it provides for a Extremely high scalability, um, particularly if you aren't us and therefore can possibly use somebody else's hardware. Um, in, in our application space, that's not very practical, so uh, we can't do that. And uh, it, it also has the advantage that you can run, you can have people with their own image in there, which is tightly resource constrained, but you can run more than one of them on a node. So, for instance, you can give one job. You know, four cores and another job, two cores and another, you know, and have a couple of single core jobs in theory. Um, and you can get fairly strong isolation there. Obviously, there are shared resources underneath, and you probably can't afford to completely isolate, say, network bandwidth at the bottom layer. You can do some, but um, if you go overboard, you spend all your time on accounting. Um, you, you also uh, can, uh, again, tailor the, tailor the images to the job. Um, and in this environment, actually, you can do that a little even more strongly than the than the uh, subcluster approach, in that you can often do you know run a five year old operating system or a ten year old operating system if you're using full virtualization, um, and that can allow you know allow obsolete code with weird baselines to work, which is important in our, in our space because the average program runs ten years or more, um, or a average project runs ten years or more. Um, and as a result, you know, you might have to go rerun this program that was written way back on some ancient version of Windows or whatever. Um, it also does provide the ability to recover resources, as I was talking about before, uh, where that you can't do easily with subclusters because you can just slip another another image on on there and say, yeah, you can use anything that you know, give that image idle priority essentially. Um, Downside, of course, is that it is in complete isolation, in that there is the shared hardware. Um, you're not likely to find, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think any of the virtualization systems out there right now, uh, uh, you know, virtualize your segment of memory bandwidth or your your segment of uh, of cache of cache space. So, you know, inter users can in fact interfere with themselves and each other in this environment. Um, it's also uh, not real efficient for small jobs. Um, the cost of running an entire OS for every job is fairly high. Um, even with relatively light uh, Unix-like OSs, you're still looking at you know, a couple hundred megabytes in practice um, once you get everything up and running, unless you run something totally stripped down. Um, and uh, there's significant overhead. Uh, there's CPU slowdown typically in the you know, typical estimates are in the 20% range. Numbers really range from 50% to 5%, depending on what exactly you're doing, uh, possibly even lower. 
or higher, um, and and just you know the the, the overhead that, that because you have that whole OS, there's a lot of a lot of uh, duplicate uh, stuff. You know, the various vendors have have their answers. They claim you know we can we can merge that and you know say oh you're running the same kernel, so you'll keep your memory. We use the same memory, but um, at some level, it's all going to get duplicated. Uh, a related option um, comes from sort of the, the internet hosting industry, which is to use virtual private, which is the technology from virtual private servers. Uh, the example that everyone here is probably familiar with is jails, where you can provide, you know, your, your own file system route and your own network interface um, and whatnot. And uh, the nice thing about this is that unlike full virtualization, uh, the overhead is very small. Um, it basically costs you, uh, you know, an entry in your process table, or, or an entry in a few structures, and then there's some extra tests in the kernel. But otherwise, um, there's there's not the huge overhead of full virtualization. You don't need an extra kernel for every image. Uh, you know, so you get you get the difference here between being able to run maybe, oh, you might be able to squeeze 200 VMware images onto a machine. VMware people will say, no, no, don't do that. But we have machines that are running nearly that many. Um, uh, so, you know, there, but on the other hand, there are people out there who run thousands of, uh, of uh, virtual hosts using this technique on a single machine. So big, big difference in resource use, um, especially with light, in the lightly loaded use. Uh, in our environment, we're looking more at running a very small number of them, but still, that overhead is significant. Um, you still do have some ability to tailor the uh, images to a job's needs. Um, you, you could have a custom route that, for instance, you could be running FreeBSD 6 in one, uh, in one uh, virtual server and 7 in another. You have to be running, of course, a 7 kernel or an 8 kernel to make that work, but it allows you to do that. You also, in principle, can do evil things like run a 64-bit kernel and then 32-bit user spaces because, say, you have applications that you can't find the source to anymore, um, or li libraries you don't have the source to anymore. Um, and, and so, interesting things there. And the other nice thing is that since you're, you're doing a very lightweight and incomplete virtualization, you don't have to virtualize things you don't care about, so you don't have the overhead of, of virtualizing everything. Downsides, of course, are incomplete isolation. I mean, you are running processes then on the same kernel, and they can interfere with each other. And there's reduced flexibility. Obviously, um, I don't think anyone's going to write, you know, the, to to add the ability to run Windows in a jail. Um, you know, there was some NetBSD PCOF support, but uh, I don't think it's really gotten to that point. Um, one one final area. Um, which sort of diverges from this is to revert to sort of the classic Unix solution to the problem um, on the on single on a, you know single machines, which is to use existing uh, resource limits and resource partitioning techniques. Um, so, you know, for example, all Unix-like operating systems have per process resource limits um, and per user resource limits. Typically, um, scheduler most uh, um, cluster schedulers support the common ones. So you can set a uh, you know memory limit on your process or a CPU time limit on your process, um, and the schedulers typically provide at least blunt support for think for uh, uh, for limits on an aggregate set of processes that are part of a job. Um, also, most you know there are there are a number of forms of resource partitioning that are sort of available by in a as a standard feature. Uh, so memory disks are one of them. So you can, you, if you want to create a file system space that's limited in size, create a memory disk um, and back it with an mmap, MMAP, back it with swap or back it with an mmap file. Um, quotas are another mechanism of partitioning uh, disk use. Um, and then there are techniques like CPU affinity so that you can lock processes to a, a single process, processor or a set of processors. Uh, and so they can't interfere with each other with processes running on other processors. Uh, the nice thing about this, of course, is that you're using existing facilities, so you don't have to rewrite uh, lots of new features uh, for a niche application. Um, and they tend to integrate well with existing schedulers. In many cases, port parts of them are already implemented. Uh, and in fact, the experiments I'll talk about later are all using this type of technique. Um, 
cons are, of course, incomplete isolation again. And there's typically no unified framework for a concept of a job when a job is composed of a set of processes. Um, you know, there, there are a number of data structures within the kernel, for instance, the session, um, which sort of aggregate processes, but there isn't one uh, in, in BSD or Linux at this point, which allows you to place resource limits on those in the way that you can a process. Um, IREX did have support like that, um, where they have a job ID and job, and there can be a job limit. Uh, and Solaris projects are sort of similar, but not, not quite the same. Processes are part of a project, but it's not quite the same inherited relationship. Um, typically, there aren't uh, limits on things like bandwidth. There was um, a sort of a, a, a bandwidth limiting uh, nice type uh, interface um, that I, I saw posted as a research project many years ago, I think in the 2.x days, um, where you could say, this process can have you know, five megabits or, or whatever, but I haven't really seen anything take off. That would be a pretty neat thing to have. Uh, actually, one, one other exception there is uh, on, on IREX again, um, the XFS file system supported guaranteed data rates on file handles. So you could say, I w you could open a file and say, I need 10 megabits read or 10 megabits write or whatever, and it would say, okay or no. And, and then you could read and write, and it would do evil things with the file system layout in some cases uh, to ensure that you could get that streaming data rate by, uh, by keeping the file uh, in, uh, aligned. So now I'm going to talk about what we've done. Um, you know, what, what we needed was a solution that handled our wide range of job types. Um, and so of the options that I talked about, uh, we looked at single application clusters or project clusters. Um, I mean, I, I think that the isolation they provide is, is essentially unparalleled. Um, and But in our environment, we'd probably have to virtualize in order to be efficient in terms of being able to handle our different job mix and whatnot and handle the fact that our users tend to have um, spike, spikes in their, in their use um, on, a, on a large scale. So for instance, we'll get GPS, we'll show up and say, we need to run for a month. Um, and then some indeterminate number of months later, they'll do it again. Um, so for, for, for that sort of quick demands, uh, we, we really need the virtualiz something virtualized. And then we'd have to pay the price of, uh, of the overhead. Um, and again, it doesn't handle small jobs well, and that's, that is a large portion of our, our job mix. So of the quarter million or something jobs we've run uh, on, on our cluster, um, I would guess that more than half of those were submitted in, in uh, batches of more than 10,000. So, so they'll just pop up. Um, the, other, the other methods we've looked at and are, uh, are using resource limits. Um, the nice thing, of course, is they're achievable with, uh, they achieve use, useful isolation, and they're implementable with either existing functionality or small extensions. So that's what we've been concentrating on. We've also been doing some thinking about, could we use the techniques there and combine them with jails or related features, um, you know, maybe bulking up jails to be more like uh, zones in Solaris or containers, I think they're calling them this week. Um, and uh, so we're looking at that as well. Uh, to be able to provide, uh, well, to, to, to be able to provide uh, per-user operating environments, uh, potentially isolating users from uh, upgrades. So, for instance, we could upgrade the kernel, and users could continue using an old image if they don't have time to rebuild their application and handle the updates in libraries and whatnot. Um, and uh, they also have the potential to provide strong isolation for security purposes, uh, which could be useful in the future. Um, we do think that the of the, of the two of these of these mechanisms, the nice thing is that resource limit the resource limits in partitioning scheme as well as virtual private service have very similar implementation requirements. Um, setups fare a bit more expensive in uh, the VPS case, but nonetheless they're fairly similar. So what we've been doing is we've taken the SunGrid we've taken SunGrid engine. And we were originally intending to actually extend SunGrid Engine and modify its daemons to do, to do the work. Um, what we ended up doing instead is we realized that, well, we can actually specify an alternate program to run instead of the shepherd. Uh, the shepherd is the process that uh, starts all of, all, 
starts the the script that can for each job on a given node. Um, it collects usage, forwards signals to the children, and uh, also is responsible for starting remote uh, remote components. So a shepherd is started, and then in tra traditionally in SunGrid Engine, it starts a its own R shell daemon, and uh, jobs connect over. These days, they've written their own their own mechanism, which is secure and not using the crafty old R shell code. Um, so, um, let's see here. So what we've done is we've implemented a wrapper script, uh, which allows a pre-command hook to run before shepherd, the shepherd starts, a command wrapper, so before we start shepherd, we can run things like the env program, or we can run uh, truth or whatever uh, to set up the environment that it runs in, um, or CPU set, as I'll show later. Um, and then a post command hook for cleanup. It's implemented in Ruby because I felt like it. Um, so the first thing we implemented was memory backed temporary directories. The motivation for this is that um, we've had problems where users will, you know, say run run slash temp out on the nodes. Uh, the way we have our nodes configured is we net boot, but they do have disks, and most of the disk is available as slash temp. Um, we had some cases of particularly early on where users would fill up the disk and then not delete it and you know, their job would crash or they would forget to add cleanup code or whatever. And then other jobs would fail strangely. Um, you, know, you might expect that you would just get a, you would get a nice error message, but programmers being programmers, um, you know, people would not do their error handling correctly. A number of libraries too have issues like, for instance, uh, the PVM library unexpectedly fails and reports a completely strange error if it can't create a file in temp because it needs to create a Unix domain socket so it can talk to itself. So what we've done here is it turns out that SunGrid Engine actually set, creates a temporary directory off to the, in, un, typically under slash temp, but you can change that, um, and points tempter to that uh, location. Now, we've educated most of our users now to use that location correctly. So they'll, they'll use that variable, they'll create their files under tempter, and then when the job exits, Grid Engine deletes the directory. So that, that all gets cleaned up. The problem, of course, being that if multiple jobs are running on the same node at the same time, one of them can still fill temp. Um, so the solution was pretty simple. We, we created a, a wrapper script that at the beginning of the job creates a... a uh, memory files to swap back to MD file system um, of a user requestable size with a default. And uh, so this, this has a, a number of advantages. The biggest one, of course, is that it's fixed size. So, you know, we get the, uh, the user gets uh, exact what they asked for. And once they run out of space, they run out of space. And well, too bad, they ran out of space. Um, you know, they should have asked for more. Um, it, the the other uh, um, the the other advantage as a side effect is that now that we're running swap back memory file systems for temp users who only use a fairly small amount of temp get should see vastly improved performance because they're running in memory um, rather than writing to disk. Um, so, quick example: um, we have a little job script here um, that you know prints the tempter and prints the prints the uh, amount of space. We can submit our job request saying that we want this. We want 100 megabytes of temp space. Um, the uh, the sync dash y is just so the program doesn't. So the program ends at the end of it. Uh, if I were doing it as a live demo, uh, and then if you look at the output, um, you can see that it does in fact it creates a memory file system. Um, I attempted to do, uh, write code to have an available space that was a, roughly what the user asked for. Um, the version that I had when I was testing this was not entirely accurate. Um, trying, to round, trying to guess what all the UFS overheads would be to use the result was uh, not quite uh, consistent. It's not, it does, I, I couldn't figure out an easy linear function, so it does a better job than it did to start with, but it's not perfect. Um, so. Sometimes, however, so that, that, that's a good fix. We're planning to deploy it pretty soon. Um, it works pretty easily. Um, however, sometimes it's not enough. The biggest issue is that there are badly designed programs all, all over the world that don't use Tempter like they're supposed to. And in fact, there's an easy solution. Read only Tempter. Uh, 
Sure. Yeah, why not? Try it. Solves the problem. Lots of things to kill over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are there are all these applications. Um, there are a lot of applications still that need temp because, say, during startup, um, and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so there, we have we have problems with these, and you know, realistically, we can't change all of them. It's just not going to happen. Um, so we still have problems with people running out the resources. So, um, so we feel that you know probably the the most general solution is to provide a per, per job slash temp and virtualize that portion of the file system namespace. Um, we variant symlinks can do that, and so we decided okay, let's give that a shot. Um, so, just to introduce the concept of variant symlinks for people who aren't familiar with them. Um, variant symlinks are basically symlinks that contain variables that which are expanded at runtime, which allows pa paths to be different for different processes. For example, um, if you create some files, um, you create a, a, a symlink whose contents are this variable, which has a default shell style default value, um, and you, you see that you get different results with different variables set. So, Talk about our, the implementation we've done. It's derived from the Dragonfly implementation. Most of the data structures are identical. Um, however, I've made a number of changes. The biggest one is that we took the concept of uh, scopes and we turned them entirely around. Um, in, uh, in Dragonfly, there's a system scope, which is over, overridden by a user scope and then a per process scope. Um, the problem with that is if you only think about, say, the system scope, um, and you decide you want to do something clever, like you know, have a have a root file system, which uh, or slash lib points to different things for different uh, different architectures. Well, it works very nicely until the users come along and set their set their arch variable uh, for you. And if you have, say, a set UID program and you don't defensively and you don't uh, implement correctly. Um, the obvious bad things happen. Obviously, you would break your code to not do that, and I believe they did. But there's a whole class of problems where it's easy to screw up and, and, and do something wrong there. So by uh, reversing the order, we can, we can reduce the risks. Um, at the moment, we don't have a user scope. I just don't like the idea of a user scope, to be honest. The problem being that you then have to have per user state in kernel that just sort of sits around forever. You can never garbage collect it except administratively. Um, just doesn't seem like a great idea to me. Um, and jail scope just hasn't been implemented because um, it wasn't entirely clear what the uh, semantics should be. Um, I also uh, added uh, default variable support, sort of shell, shell style variable support. This, to some extent, undoes the scope uh, the scope change in that the default variable becomes a system scope which is overridden by everything, but there are cases where we need to do that. And in particular, if we want to implement this uh, slash temp which varies, then we have to do something like this because temp needs to work if, the, uh, if we don't have the uh, job value set. Um, <clears throat> I also decided to use uh, um, percent instead of uh, dollar sign to avoid confusion with shell variables because these are a separate namespace in the kernel. We can't do what domain OS did and do all the evaluation in user space. Um, it's classic vulnerability um, in, uh, in CV database, for instance. Um, and we're not using at to con avoid confusion with uh, AFS and or the, NF or the NetBSD implementation, which does not allow user or administratively settable values. Um, I've added login.conf support. Um, I don't have any automated variables such as the uh, the percent sys value, which is universally set in the NetBSD implementation, or um, a you know a, a UID variable, which they also have. Um, and currently, I don't allow setting of setting of values in other processes. You can only set them in your own and inherit. Um, that may change, but. Uh, one of my goals here is because there are subtle ways to make dumb mistakes and cause security vulnerabilities, I, I have attempted to slim the feature set down to the point where you have some reasonable chance of not, not doing that um, if you start building systems on them and deploying. Um, 
So, okay. So the, the final area that we've worked on um, is moving away from the file system space and into uh, CPU sets. So now, uh, Jeff Robertson uh, implemented a uh, program, uh, implemented a CPU set functionality, which allows you to create, put a process into a CPU set and then set the affinity of that CPU set. By default, every process has an anonymous, an anonymous CPU set unless it was stuffed into one that was created by its, in a, in a parent. Um, so for a little background here, in a typical SGE configuration, every node has one slot per CPU. Um, there's, there are a number of other ways you can configure it. Basically, a slot is something a job can run in. Um, and a parallel job crosses slot can can have more than be in more than one slot, but uh, uh, for instance, in many applications where, for instance, code tends to spend a fair bit of time waiting for I/O, you'll allocate more than one slot per CPU. So two slots per per core is not uncommon, but probably the most common configuration and the one that you get out of the box when you just install Grid Engine is one slot for each CPU. And that's how, that's how we run, because we want users to have that whole CPU for whatever they want to do with it. Um, so jobs are allocated one or more slots, if they're uh, depending on whether they're sequential or parallel jobs and how many they ask for. Um, but, but, there is, but this is just a convention. There's no actual connection between slots and CPUs. So it's quite possible to submit, to, to submit a non-parallel job that goes off and spawns a zillion threads. And, sucks up all the CPU on the system. Um, in some early versions of Grid Engine, uh, there, there actually was uh, support for tying, uh, tying slots to CPUs if you set it up that way. There was a sensible implementation for IREX and then things got weirder and weirder as people tried to implement it on other platforms which had vastly different CPU binding semantics. Um, and at this point, it's entirely broken um, on every platform as far as I can tell. Um, so we decided, okay, we've got this wrapper. Let's see what we can do um, in terms of making things work. So we we uh, now have have the uh, the wrapper store allocations of, in the file system, um, and we have a na naive recursive uh, allocation algorithm. What we try to do is find the best fit fitting s um, set of adjacent cores, um, and then if that doesn't work, we take the largest and repeat. Um, until we fit, or until we've got enough uh, slots. Our goal is to minimize new fragments. We haven't done any analysis to determine whether that's actually an appropriate algorithm. Um, but offhand, it seems you know fine, given that I thought it up over lunch. Um, so should port easily to other OSs. Um, turns out the FreeBSD CPU set a API and the Linux one differ differ only in the very small details. Um, they're essentially exactly identical, which is convenient semantically. So converting between them is pretty straightforward. Um, so I did a set of benchmarks to demonstrate the effectiveness of CPU set. They also happen to demonstrate the, uh, the uh, wrapper, but don't really have any relevance. Uh, used a little 8-core uh, Intel uh, Xeon box um, and 7.1 uh, uh, pre-release that had John Baldwin backported uh, uh, CPU set uh, from eight uh, shortly before the release. Well, not so shortly. It was supposed to be shortly before. Um, and uh, then SGE 6.2. Uh, we used a simple integer benchmark. It's an uh, nQueens prod program where it attempts to place, take out a, for instance, an eight, this, an eight by eight board and place eight queens so they can't capture each other uh, on the board. Um, so it's it's a simple simple load benchmark. Um, we hit we ran a, a small version of the problem as our as our measured command, and then to generate load, we ran a larger version that ran much longer. Um, so some results. Um, so for a baseline, you know, well, I think the the most interesting thing is you do a baseline run, and you see there's some variance, not really very high. Not surprising, it doesn't really do anything um, except suck CPU, so uh, really not much going on. Um, if we go into this case where we've got seven load processes and a single um, single uh, test process running, uh, we see things slow down slightly and uh, standard deviation goes up a bit. Um, there's a little bit of deviation from baseline, 
Um, the, the the explanation is is clearly that you know we're just context switching a bit more, um, in the and uh, because we don't have CPUs that are doing nothing at all, um, the system, there's some extra load from the system as well, since the kernel has to run and background tasks have to run. Um, we go up to this case where we have a badly behaved application. So we, we now have eight load processes which would suck up all the CPU, and then we try to run our measurement process. We see a you know substantial performance decrease, um, you know about in the in the range we'd expect. Uh, see about an eighth decrease, um, and then we fire it up with the CPU set, and quite nicely. The the interesting thing here is you see we get no statistically significant difference. Uh, between the baseline case with with uh, seven processors, if we use CPU sets, we don't see this variance, which is nice. And that th this shows that that uh, we actually we actually see a slight performance improvement, and uh, we uh, we see a reduction in variance. Um, so so CPU set is actually improving performance even when we're not overloaded. And then we see in the overloaded case, it's exact it's the same. Um, or the other, the other uh, processes are stuck on other CPUs. Um, one interesting side note, actually, is that when I was, do when I was doing some tests early on, um, we actually saw, I tried doing the baseline and then the baseline was CPU set. And if you just fired it off with the original algorithm, which grabbed, the, grabbed CPU zero, you saw a significant performance decline because there's a lot of stuff that ends up running on CPU zero, which, uh, <clears throat> Led, led to the, uh, the quick observation that you want to allocate from the large numbers down um, so that you use the CPUs which are not running the random processes that get stuck on zero or getting all the interrupts in some architectures um, and avoid core zero in particular. So some conclusions. Um, I think we have useful proof of concept. We're going to be deploying uh, certainly the, mem the uh, memory stuff soon. Once we upgrade to uh, 7, we'll definitely be deploying the CPU set stuff as well, since so it both, both improves performance in the contented case and the uncontented case. Um, we would like in the future to do some more work with the virtual private server stuff. In particular, I think it would be really interesting to be able to run different different FreeBSD versions in jails, or to run, uh, for instance, uh, run CentOS images in jails, since we're running CentOS on our uh, Linux-based systems. Uh, there could actually be some really interesting things there uh, in that, for instance, we could run, we could potentially detrace Linux applications, which is never gonna happen on native Linux. Uh, we also, for, there's another example where um, Paul Saab was doing some benchmarking recently and relative to Linux on the same hardware, he was seeing a three and a half times improvement um, in basic matrix multiplication um, relative to current with, with current because of uh, FreeBSD's super pages functionality, um, where you vastly reduce the number of TLB entries uh, in, in the page table. And so that sort of thing could apply even to our Linux using population, could give uh, FreeBSD some real wins there. Um, so, would like to look at that more, uh, a little more on the point of isolating users from kernel upgrades. One of the issues we've had is that, you know, when you do a new bump, we have users who depend on all sorts of all sorts of libraries, and many of which, you know, the vendors like to rev them and do stupid API breaking changes fairly regularly. So it'd be nice for our users if we could get all the benefits to kernel upgrades, and they wouldn't have they could upgrade at their leisure. Um, so we're hoping to do that in the future as well. Uh, we'd like to see more limits on bandwidth type resources. Um, for instance, say limiting the amount of, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to limit the amount of socket IO, uh, but it's hard if you want to place a total limit on network bandwidth by a particular process when all of our store, almost all of our storage is in on, on NFS. So how do you classify that traffic without a fair bit of change to the kernel and somehow tagging that um, is an interesting challenge. Um, We'd also like to see it, it'd be neat if somebody would implement something like the Linux, the uh, IREX job ID rather, um, to allow the scheduler to just tag uh, processes as part of a job. Um, currently, uh, Grid Engine uses a clever but evil hack where they uh, add an extra group to the process and they just have a range of groups that are available. So they get inherited and the users can't drop them. So that allows them to track the process, but it's an ugly hack. And with the current limits on the number of groups, it can become a real problem. So 
Actually, before I take questions, uh, I do want to put in a, one quick plug. If you think this stuff's interesting and you live in the area and maybe you're looking for a, looking for a job, we are, we are trying to hire a few people. It's difficult to hire, but we do have some, some openings, and we are looking for BSD people and general system admin people. So, questions? Yes. Have you run uh, with, with the CPU <coughs> set functionality that you put into the, the grid engine so in the jobs to produce the uh, Have you noticed anything where you run a memory bandwidth intensive task and your tools and you sort of run out of memory IO? I am. Um, I would I would expect that to happen, but it's not something I've I've attempted to test. Um, what I would really like actually would be to have a more topology aware allocator so that you could request that you know I want I want to share cache or I want to not share cache or I want to share memory bandwidth or not share memory bandwidth. Um, actually, OpenMPI 1.3 on the Linux side has a topology aware wrapper for for their CPU functionality. Um, and they actually have something called uh, PLAP. It's the Portable Linux uh, out CPU allocators. I don't remember what it's actually thing. What it what it actually the acronym is. But in essence, they have to work around the fact that there are three standard. There there are three different kernel ABIs for the same syscall <laughs> for CPU allocation because all the vendors did it themselves. Somehow used the same number, but. They're completely incompatible. So these guys wrote a probe routine that when you first load the application, it calls into the syscall and attempts to figure out which one it is by what errors it returns depending on what arguments you handled. It's completely evil. I think people should port the their API and we should have their library work, but we don't need to do that junk because we didn't make that mistake. <laughs> um, so I would like to see the topology aware stuff in particular. Mentioned the uh, uh, limiting bandwidth network bandwidth. Um, I I recall reading something about limiting all Q stuff into packet filter, and what you could use with jails. Yeah. So I mean, you, well, the trick is that you you want to be able to. It, it's easy to limit application bandwidth. Um, fair, fairly easy to limit application bandwidth. Uh, it becomes more difficult when you have to, if, if your interface is shared between application traffic and, um, say, NFS, getting classifying that is going to be trickier. You'll have to tag, you'll ha you'd have to add a fair bit of code to, to trace that down through the kernel and limit it at the right place. It's certainly doable. Right. Yeah. Well, now that you've done multiple IPs in the jail, why don't you just do this easy trick of putting all your NFS on the um, I, 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 I have com contemplated doing just that. Or, in fact, um, the other thing we've considered doing more as a research project than as a practical thing would be actually alloc would, would be independent VLANs because then we could do things like give each process a VLAN so they couldn't even share at the Ethernet layer. Um, once vImage is in place, for instance, we will be able to do that and say, you know, you've got your interface, it's yours, whatever. Um, but then we could limit it. We could, we could rate limit that at the kernel, and we could also have, we'd have a physically isolated, we'd have a logically isolated uh, network as well. With some of the latest switches, we could actually rate limit in the sw at the switch as well. Uh, two questions. Does a sensitivity of the data, like if it's more sensitive than other data that's being processed or run on the cluster, does that affect scheduling? And then secondly, uh, can you comment on how you handle NFS failure? Because I know that's a, that's a, a problem. Um, so to the first question, we don't run multiple sensitivity data on this cluster, this unclassified cluster. Um, so we've, we've avoided that problem by not allowing it. Um, but it is, it is a real issue. Um, it's just not one we've had to deal with. Um, in practice, most stuff that's sensitive um, has handling requirements that mean it can't touch the same hardware without a scrub. So you would need a pretty ridiculously aggressive 
you, you would need a very coarse granularity and a ridiculous node imaging process that you know removed all of the data. So if I were to do that, I would probably get rid of the disks um, and just go diskless. That would get rid of my number one failure case, so that'd be pretty good, but I haven't done it. Um, NFS failures. Um, so we have, we have had occasional problems with NFS overloading. We haven't had real problem. We're, we're all on a local network and it's fairly tightly contained, so we haven't had problems with things um, with you know the server going down for extended periods and causing everything to hang. I mean, it, it's been more of an issue of, I mean, there, there's a there's a problem that uh, Panassas described as incast, where you know we can take out any NFS server. Um, I mean, we had the Blue Arc guys come in and they're doing FPGA based stuff with multiple 10 gig links. And I said, you know, I've got users who do this, and they said, uh, could we not try it with your whole cluster? Because um, if you got 350 gigabit Ethernet interfaces going into a system, even 10 gig you can saturate pretty trivially. So at that level, there's sort of an inherent problem. Um, if we need to handle that kind of bandwidth, we've got to go to parallel, a parallel file system, go with Luster, or if we're doing streaming stuff, we could go with Isolon or something. Anyone else? Thank you, everyone. <laughs>